Uh, there's some guys that are like, uh, they're cutting down trees, but they really don't know what they're doing. And there's, first off, you know, like if, you, if you're going to grab chainsaws, we'll use that as an example. Cause, yeah, I'm a little bit of a, chain, of a chainsaw guy. But first off, if you see a guy in the video and he doesn't have any PPE on, uh, and he's one, of, he's an old guy, he's one of the old tough guys, kind of, take his advice and stuff like that, but look for a younger guy who has the helmet on. I would not go near a birch with a chainsaw without a helmet. Like, I mean, that birch right in front of me is a prime example. You see the branch, the, the widowmaker just hanging in there. If I ever have to cut that down, that's a scary job. It's an easy tree to cut down size-wise, but boy, that thing can snap in half halfway down, you know what I mean? And almost everything at the top of that tree can kill you, even, even the little stuff. So when I'm looking at it like that, okay, uh, there's, uh, you know, skills. You know what I mean? So look at the guys. Go on the actual manufacturer's websites because they usually give you the basics to start. But they won't tell you the complicated stuff. Like, for example, that tree that's straight there, they'll show you how to cut down that big pine tree right there uh, fairly safely, but they won't tell you how to do that, that leaning oak right beside it. You know what I mean? Uh, that's when things start getting really dangerous really quick, right? And you won't know it until you get into it. And if you get into it inadequately, uh, you don't even know what you don't know. And you're a danger to yourself just based on that. So the, the skills is something, whatever tool you're going to get, like, for example, I'm looking at pole arm, uh, cha like chainsaws, like little electric pole arms or whatever, or gas powered pole arms for cutting branches and pruning and stuff. And I will say this, um, pruning is, you know, a very, very delicate thing that you have to learn how to do. Uh, so I'm going to research the hell out of that thing before I even use it. So I have some sort of an idea because what will happen is you'll go and you'll make your first cut and suddenly the chains bind in a branch that you haven't cut through the whole way because you cut it wrong you know what i mean and it's like now you got this thing up in the tree uh where you can't get it <laughs> you know what i mean uh and you don't want to be doing that you know so you want to learn how to use your tools properly and safely and you have to get rid of your ego to do this and you have to be open to new ideas and stuff like I watched a guy last night talking about how every new chainsaw is crap and I'm like if they were crap nobody would buy them you know what I mean but I also get the mindset of guys that work with old equipment and of course it doesn't matter what it is the older cars are better than the newer cars the uh, older saws are better than the newer saws uh, the older this the older that is always better than whatever's new all the time and it's not necessarily the case because things are different and a lot of people don't like change uh, some things that are newer are suck. There, there's no doubt about that. But when you're educated enough to know what you're getting, then you know if you're getting something that sucks or not, or compromised, right? Uh, like, for example, a lot of the new big chainsaws are a lot lighter, but they're built lighter because to get the light. But it doesn't mean they're built poorly. They're just built lighter because manufacturing has come a long way too. So you, you can't antiquate with built like a brick shit house is more reliable than light, nimble, and whatever, because it might not necessarily be that. You know, like the components might be stronger. You know what I mean? Steel, st uh, steel chainsaws versus plastic chainsaws. I've seen both break, and I've seen more steel chainsaws break than plastic ones. You know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and it is what it is. You know what I mean? And the thing is, is the one you're, you know, like uh, there's there's a whole bunch of things like that that you learn. So learn the new equipment, learn the old equipment. Yeah, there's disadvantages to the new equipment on a lot of... One of the main gripes that the old guys have is they can't work on the new stuff because it's all electronic, right? Which I do see that, but how well does electronics hold up? Well, you talk to a guy that's been using electronic equipment uh, stuff for years. It's like, yeah, this thing's eight years old. That's eight years old. Here's my older saw. Okay, it's 20 years old just because it's 20 years old. Uh, which one do I use most? I use the new saw because it, it doesn't fuss at all. <laughs> Where the other guy's talking about, yeah, but the other saw, I could tune it to this. Tune it. Yeah, and you got to tune it five times a day. Where the other saw, okay, it might not last as long, but you never, you ne until it dies, you never have to mess with it, right? What's that worth, you know? Um, so, but just learning skills of how to do things the right way, right? 
uh, like for example when i start getting going on the tree stuff a little bit more my pricing uh, i'm not going to be the guy that's going to come in and undercut everybody why those guys never make money and they just ruin the reputation trying to you know spend a hundred dollars to make 10 you know what i mean i say go and get the good stuff once you're able to i get it you have to start somewhere so buy the best equipment you can afford maybe buy a little bit less equipment and just better quality you know what i mean uh, i'd give that advice because i'd rather not have something break down because there's nothing worse than when you're on the job and it's like oh i gotta take a couple of minutes to fix this equipment or fix that equipment um I'd rather just say I don't have it. You know what I mean? Uh, like people ask me, Reg, you got chainsaws? Yeah, but the, my big chainsaws are broke. I can only use the little chainsaws. I'll show you what I can do with it. You know what I mean? And now some of my little chainsaws are starting to have issues, uh, like Mini Beast. You know, it's still a good saw, but uh, like yesterday he was flooded all day. Um, you know, uh, and I couldn't unflood him. And, uh, you know, I don't have time to work on it and stuff like that. Well, you know, I'm on somebody else's time. I should be working, right? Uh, but I got, I had my backup saw, which worked all day fine. And it's just yesterday was really cold in the morning, and I didn't warm up the saw well. And, and what ended up happening is it flooded, and once it flooded, it, you know, I, you know, you got to walk away from it for an hour, and if it doesn't restart, um, you know, after that, then it's flooded for the day, right? You might as well just, you know, put it away. So redundant equipment is something that, you know, like, no, just get the cheap equipment or, you know, don't just get one thing, get like duplicates so that you always have a backup, right? Because usually by the end of the season, something's going to break down on you, right? But work your way up to stuff. That's the other thing too. Like, don't go into debt until you have to. Like, when the big money shows up, no problem. But till the big money shows up, you have to basically kind of be smart enough to spend the money right so you're not just going out and just creating all this debt for yourself you know like uh, you know it, it, let's say you want to get into yard working or trees or whatever and you're like okay well today i'm going to go out and i'm going to buy ten thousand dollars worth of equipment well you don't have any clientele yet <laughs> you know what i mean um uh, like for example yard work uh, a lot of clients have their own lawnmowers almost none of them have a whippersnipper uh, so maybe you buy the whippersnipper first, use their lawnmowers until you can afford your own and then whatever. But there's also a problem with having your own mowers and stuff like that is you have to maintain them. Uh, you usually have to charge a little bit more to use them. Um, the upside is that you got usually better equipment. Uh, so there's things like that. You have to know how to weigh stuff so you can price stuff fairly. You know, so if you have like a, 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 a you know, a $700 payment on a, a riding mower, I mean, some of those things are 20 grand, right? Uh, so you got a $700 payment a month on that thing. You better be making some serious coin, right? Uh, maybe buy the cheaper mower first that, okay, it's in good shape, whatever. Or use the clients until you can go out and buy a smaller one and buy the bigger one. You know, uh, so each week or even each job that you do, you take a percentage of that and you put it back into maintenance. So a lot of people in these kind of businesses, you know, something that happens is they have um, a lot of money coming in, but they don't have any disposable income hardly at all because it's all tied up into the business. And the, the, the first five years of most businesses are like that, where, you know, you have to have a float. Right now, I don't really have a float. So, for example, I still got it. You know, as of next week, I have to dish out the money to get my gas tank filled, right? Uh, until uh, what I'm going to do with every client this year is I'm going to have them buy their own gas tanks if they don't already have them and just fill their gas tanks. I'll do all the, you know, the two-stroke mix stuff like that and get them to cover that cost anyway. And then that way, each client has their own uh, tucked away somewhere, you know, in a garage or whatever. And you just use theirs, and when it's empty, they you refill it. That way, you're not sharing the gas, but you know, one gas can between five clients. And okay, well, what do you charge everybody? This guy takes an hour of whipper snipping. This guy's five minutes. This, you know, what I mean, how do you charge for that? So you end up charging people way more than what it would cost them if they just had their own proprietary gas cans. So you could save a lot of money that way, and that way you're never on the hook for anything either, because you could be losing money on that, and you don't know because you don't know how to charge. 
okay, I run, uh, you know, like you sit there with a calculator, okay, this burns so much uh, per hour, um, you know, I burn three tanks an hour, times that by the cost of fuel, you, you know what I mean, like, fuel price, prices are way too subjective now <laughs> to be able to do that, right? Uh, so, like, the next time you fill up, it might cost you 5 or $10 more than it did the last time, you know, in, in a small can, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because